Yes, I I'm from a university, the IT University of Copenhagen, and um, and uh, I uh, specialize on mobile media and aspects of empowerment and democracy, uh, especially with a focus on, on uh, young children. What my uh, purpose here today is actually to to go in a little bit of another direction than John uh, and focus somewhat on aspects of uh, cultural diversity when we're talking about uh, opportunities and risks in uh, relation to uh, to the use of mobile media. Um, because I think that sometimes we tend to generalize very much when we're talking about, for instance, protection, but also opportunities and how we use uh, uh, digital media, but uh, also especially mobile uh, media in various uh, national and, and international contexts. So that's what I'm going to, to talk about. And you can't see this, but this is just the agenda, a few things I'm going to talk about. I had, well, a little bit about the access to mobile phones around the globe. Then I would have liked to, to give you an overview of uh, the global access to mobile internet, but I couldn't actually uh, access any uh, anything that compiled, compiled a lot of information there, so you won't get that, but I'll give you a few informations on, on the Danish part of that. And then uh, I'll introduce some questions about the opportunities and risks and cultural diversities and give you a little uh, case story from, from my Danish uh, research project. Oh, this perhaps is more easy to read. This uh, is an ITU, not my ITU, but the International Telecommunication Union's uh, figure over the development of uh, online uh, on mobile telephone subscribers from 1997 to 2007. And the blue ones are the develop, uh, developed countries. Um, and as you can see, well, it's almost 100% coverage. In Denmark, actually, we are 5.5 uh, million inhabitants, and there are 6.5 uh, mobile subscriptions. So we are a little bit overloaded with mobiles. But in, in, at a general level, uh, uh, the developed countries uh, are almost 100% covered. The orange or the yellow points are the developing countries. As a, and as you can see, very interestingly, from approximately 2005, 2006, it goes rather steep upwards. And we really do see that almost 50% uh, or 45% uh, in the developing countries actually have access to mobile media now. And with this indicates that this is the platform for um, various kinds of uh, uses, uh, uh, progressive uses uh, in accordance to, for instance, learning uh, in relation to uh, aspects of democracy and empowerment and so on, which is uh, why I'm focusing on that. And we can, uh, some of the projects I've been uh, participating in show that, uh, for instance, uh, even if you have no idea what a computer is and you have no uh, access at all to any kind of digital media or other kind of media, many places in the world you would have access to a mobile phone because it's accessible. You can buy it, but it's also possible to use it in your local context because it uses so little power and because it's easy to access and easier than, than a computer to access. Um, Never use somebody else's laptop. That's really stupid. Um, this is another ITU uh, overview. This is the mobile phone use by age uh, percentage of uh, individuals. Uh, and it's very difficult to see in the back. I can see that. But uh, the bright blue um, um, columns are uh, showing uh, five to 14 year old children's access to to mobile phones, and the one at the left here uh, are the 27 European countries, showing that uh, a little more than 70% of children and young people between 5 and 14 years old have access to, to a mobile phone and use it. Uh, in some countries it's not measured, but as you can see, the one that with the tallest um, column is actually Morocco, which is very interesting. Uh, um, that's in, that's a, a country where you actually have so many mobile phones, also because not everyone have access to uh, a computer, so uh, that's one of the, the reasons. Uh, in Denmark, um, again, uh, we're above the average uh, of at the European level because almost everyone from the age of 10 to, to 14 have their own mobile, and 
the age of when you get your first mobile is decreasing, and, and that's uh, the pattern in, in many countries. And in other countries, as you can see, the middle countries here, which is Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, and other countries, uh, um, very few children actually have their own mobile, but there may be a family mobile uh, that you can actually use for various purposes. Okay, so this says use of mobile internet in Denmark, um, and uh, it shows m and mobile internet is access to uh, to the internet via mobile devices in all uh, that a little more than 40 percent in all actually use mobile devices to to access the internet, and primarily young people between 16 and 19 years old do that, and then it decreases uh, along with age. But actually, um, this covers as well uh, laptops, which very, very many young Danes actually have. They use it for school, especially high school kids, but also uh, ordinary school kids uh, have their laptops with them. Uh, so what I've encircled here are the two various kinds of, uh, of mobile phones when, when you can access uh, the internet from, um, which is less than you probably would have thought in a country where we are so uh, have so many digital media and where the population is one of the uh, populations where you have the the biggest uh, uh, integration of uh, digital media uh, in at all um, and very many actually have 3d mobile phones where you can access easily access the internet but very few do so actually Oh no, this is completely hopeless. Well, okay, this is an overview actually of the opportunities, risks, and cultural diversity I was uh, talking about. It says here to the left, it says content, uh, contact, uh, and uh, conduct, which is actually the the um, categories we're working uh, from uh, in the UK online project when we're trying to categorize various kinds and levels of opportunities and risks that we are, we are discussing. And I've just listed a few examples of, uh, of uh, these uh, categories uh, uh, regarding opportunities and risks, which is, well, for the content it may be opportunities, maybe information, documentation, creative uses, learning, while risks uh, may be harmful content, threats and bullying, and commercial exploitation uh, of the young uh, kids. Contact our social relations. Uh, the opportunities are social relations, uh, potential networking, uh, micro-coordination, while the risks are primarily meeting offenders, uh, meeting, well, peers' negative uses of the stuff that you upload to, to your computer from your mobile, and also a kind of uh, ephemeral contact with thousands of people that you're never used to, to, to very much, perhaps. And then the aspects of conduct would, for the opportunities, be again social networking, enhancing family relations, perhaps also an aspect of global reach uh, to get in contact uh, across the world uh, with other uh, people. And the, the risk aspects would be against threats and bullying, upload of uh, private content, and hacking, pirating, uh, pirating, and, and so on. But what is important, I think, uh, especially in the context of what I'm talking about, the cultural diversity, is the fact that you need to look at various aspects of a specific country, a specific culture you are, you are uh, looking at, is that you have to, to consider, for instance, aspects of access, how many and which kinds of technologies can you access, and how easily is it actually to, to use it? Do you have to actually have power where you live for, for your digital devices? Are there Wi-Fi or how, how do you actually, for instance, access uh, the internet? What's the local infrastructure like? Um, how far away from other villages or cities or uh, um, cultures are you? Um, the local media history, some places in the world, mobile media users have virtually jumped the media evolution and have never used media before, but have started using the mobile phone, which gives it a certain. We need uh, it tells us that we need to give certain considerations about what does this mean uh, in a local context that we certainly start using uh, mobile media in this way, and then the digital literacy, digital literacy aspects. How do you actually use these phones? Um, and the online uh, internet, uh, mobile internet, uh, when you're not used at all, when you haven't uh, b been used to using uh, various kinds of media. Well, a lot of people become very inventive uh, and innovative 
and, and figure out how to use these things in the way we all do for communication, information, entertainment, and trade, but also to ex exploit and explore the, the potentials that the devices actually in themselves have in the local context. There are some local culture and normativity aspects. For instance, it's, it differs very much even within the, Euro, uh, Euro, the European as, uh, countries, as we can see, but also, of course, across the, glo the globe, what norms we have considering what are considered opportunities and what are considered risks. For instance, about pornography. Uh, what does it take to, to consider something to be pornography and uh, something that should be avoided? There are the local regulations at various, various levels as well to, to be considered. So, okay. Okay, so this is uh, very quickly the Danish case story. This is a drawing made in one of my projects. It's, this drawing is actually from 2000, which shows you that the mobile phone has been, been integrated as one of more platforms for young people in Denmark for many years. Um, I played a little bit with it and updated it. Uh, this is the picture today when we're uh, studying it. And, and what I think is important to, uh, to underline is that, that even if we, as John told us, can access almost everything from our mobile platforms if we have the, the, the right devices and the Wi-Fi. Uh, it is still uh, considerably one among other media and other media opportunities that, that we have and that especially young people combine in various ways. Some places, as I said, uh, the mobile internet and the mobile phone becomes more important than in other places, which uh, the next slide, I hope, will show you. Yes. Um, it is very interesting, as I said, that in Denmark everybody has access to the internet, everybody has, everybody has uh, advanced mobile phones, but this last one says internet use. This is not the amount of use, this is just the percentage of young people at all using the mobile internet. Uh, this was in 2006, I'm just uh, analyzing the data from the 2008 data, uh, the first blue column is uh, 2004 data. It, you can see some progress and some development and see that more kids are using the mobile internet now, but not as much as uh, the companies would wish for and that we would have thought possible because they actually had these advanced devices. And why is that? Uh, why not in Denmark? Because, I mean, it's, it would be <coughs> obvious. Well, the main reason is actually that all Danish kids have access to a much better computer very nearby, two minutes away, uh, and they don't bother to, to use, to set up their mobiles and to use it for, for these, uh, for the mobile, um, various mobile aspects. But as we can see, and as John also told us, as the mobiles become not only advanced mobiles, but actually small computers that are very easy to use and very easy to set up, I think they ma that may be a trigger for at least uh, some of the kids to, to start using the mobile in Denmark. And also, of course, price, accessibility, and so on. While in Japan, for instance, half of the people using the internet are only using the mobile internet because they don't have their own, mo uh, own uh, computer um, at home or at work. So there are, this is just one example that there are uh, very many local aspects that influence the, the way we use uh, these uh, digital media. And, uh, well, let's skip talking about some of the other things here. But, well, the things that we can see, that the one, uh, some of the users that are developing are, for instance, photo and, and, and music, because, well, the technologies have become better uh, in those areas as well. Okay, another unreadable slide. Just a few examples, again, from the Danish context and the opportunities, because, I, well, I think, as John said, and, and that's, I think, as much as we can say about it is that all the things we know about opportunities and risks are enhanced and become stronger when we're talking about the mobile devices because information and communication is so accessible and, and so um, easily uh, to get and uh, the pace of the information uh, distribu distribution is uh, so, so quickly. Um, but on the other hand, of course, I think that we're talking at about 
a lot of the same things when we're talking very generally, but also about digital media generally, and then uh, about the mobile phone and the mobile internet. But I do think that there are some areas that should be mentioned uh, that are specifically interesting in the context of uh, the mobile phone, especially uh, both when we're talking about opportunities and risks, risks especially if we want to, to use the mobile for uh, developing new uh, aspects of, of, for instance, learning, democracy, and so on in, in different parts of the world. The one thing is the instant information access, that you can actually access your information everywhere, uh, and persons, communication, of course. The seamless information transportation, the fact that you can you hardly notice which platform you're on. And another aspect, for instance, about why the Dan Danish youth do not use the mobile internet that much is they use infrared and Bluetooth very much, because it's so easy. Uh, so the seamlessness of information transportation is a very important uh, aspect as well, which is connected, of course, to the cross-platform exchange. Then also aspects of creativity and user-generated content, which, of course, is already possible on all our digital devices, but the fact that you can, again, exchange information and, and moderate it and, and uh, be creative about it uh, in, in the platform that you have accessing right now. These are just the unreadable examples of uh, the general aspects of opportunities, social networks, the idea of the mobile as a lifeline in various uh, ways, micro-coordination, connectivity, intimacy and presence, control and safety, uh, documentation, and various kinds of empowerment and liberation. Uh, the and then two more aspects, which is actually, I think, very important opportunities, and that some of my import, uh, many of my informants point towards, is the fact that with your mobile, as I think John was mentioning in, in some way too, is that you are in control of your own. You can be in control of your media and your media content in a much uh, easier way than with other media. And you're also practicing social norms, social normativity, and practicing how you are uh, together with other people. and and also developing new social norms. Quickly, the risk aspects, specific risk aspects, I think, uh, regarding the mobile internet is that the, the global access to digital traces, as John also said, that we leave so many traces, what, what we're doing, and that can easily be misused in various ways. The con content is uncontrollable some way, uh, in some ways. Um, there's an, ex more extreme variations of bullying and more intense uh, variations of, of bullying that we see. There, are, as John also said, more difficult parental mediation uh, that we see. And then, of course, all the other aspects, which are not as many. I couldn't actually come up with as many as opportunities, luckily enough. But uh, the social expectations to you, the way that you have to be al always on, at least in the Western Hemisphere, the stress level of always being on, the lack of presence, which some of my informants point to, that while being always uh, online, you may not be able to be very much present in the offline uh, context. Uh, control, other people's control of you, aspects of uh, surveillance and aspects of, of bullying. So uh, this is uh, the final slide which you can't see, um, because I thought I'd end up pointing towards uh, some aspects of potential positive developments, because I think we do talk, and rightfully so, very much about uh, preventing kids from doing things, filtering, uh, and, and so on, which is, of course, very important. But uh, I think that, on the other hand, we also at the same time need to, to, to talk about how we can actually enhance the positive uh, aspects and opportunities of, especially in this uh, aspect, the, the, uh, the mobile internet. And as I said, I think that it's very important that we have a dual focus on, on, both, dual, uh, on both general and local patterns of access, consequences, and normativity. So we, of course, we'll have to take a look at how do we in general use mobile media and the mobile internet, but also to see where do we differ in various countries, uh, in various uh, contexts. Then we need to focus on developing the positive values and reflectivity along with increasing access and use. And I think uh, it goes both, of course, for the content providers and the, the hardware producers, but of course also for all of us, and parents and children themselves, teachers and, and so on, 
um, social institutions because we are producing a large part of what we are accessing on our mobile devices, on our digital devices. Uh, and I do think that it's important to, to focus on ways to, to enforce the, the, the development of the positive values and, and do it so we don't just develop more of the same but much more better uh, stuff to, to use on the mobile. Uh, and also the reflexivity, of course, of the, the meaning and the use of the, the mobile in a local context. What does it actually mean in, in your local environment that, that we're starting to use uh, mobiles, for instance? Um, so, well, the focus on development of, on the, of the quality of better technologies and software, such as, for instance, aspects of digital literacy, uh, which could be uh, best practices for both opportunities and risks, um, that you actually become better at using and e exploring and exploiting the, the possibilities of the digital media. Learning programs, just yesterday I had a meeting with some people at the Hyderabad University about the learning program for illiterate using uh, computers, but, but transferring the computer progr programs to mobiles because, as I said, that's the accessible medium. Uh, which is one aspect. Another aspect, for instance, is to, to teach uh, dyslectic uh, uh, people in Denmark, as I've been doing, um, how to, to, to read uh, uh, by using the mobile. It's assistive technologies, for instance, for disabled people in various ways, or elderly people and so on. Um, social networking, of course, uh, using it much more strategically uh, in various ways. Enhancing also creative uses, not only playing with what you can do, but really trying to, to develop those aspects. And uh, also working on aspects of microeconomies, which is going really well in very many parts of the world that you can actually see that uh, local, in local areas, uh, mobiles become very important in coordinating the, the economies uh, of, of the local uh, community. The cultural values, of course, aspects of that uh, being really clear about that we are not sharing the same cultural values across the globe and, 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 and understand what that means in various aspects also when we try to, to develop uh, various uh, content and, and hardware. And then of course the aspect of the global reach that the conscience of the global uh, uh, community is actually also an aspect that can be enhanced and in, in my way, in, in my um, understanding it would enhance uh, aspects of democracy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gita, for a really interesting uh, overview, helping us to understand more about how children are actually using mobile phones in different countries um, and reminding us also of the, the positive aspects. Um, so I pass now to Margaret Moran, who's a member of, the parla member of Parliament uh, from the UK, um, who's chair of a parliamentary grouping focusing on IT and information society issues and who's been a real champion of child protection um, uh, on the internet in the UK. Margaret, thanks. Um, thank you very much. Because I'm a parliamentarian from the UK Parliament, I haven't got any slides because we don't do technology. We still vote with quill pens and we have men with uh, and flouncy things as our, uh, and swords. Um, uh, so there's nothing to look at there. And I'm also doubly disadvantaged. I wonder if somebody could turn the lights on because I can't actually see my notes. So I'll have to make it up as I go along. Can somebody please turn the lights on? I'll just busk. If you want, I'll do a song or dance for you. I should also say that... Um, uh, if I dart out from behind here, I, I always tell people I have podiumitis, um, which is uh, based on based on the just the lights, okay, <laughs> so, uh, which is based on the fact I think I'm being moved here. As you'll see, I move I'm moving around from the podium um, on the fact that uh, I once stood at a conference and didn't realise there was a sign here which said, "Please do not take pictures of the speaker." at the podium, shoot them before they get there. So I hope you won't have the same reaction when I, by the time I finished. Um, I don't know how well that translates, by the way. I'm trying to get rid of this laptop, not have another one. Um, what I just want to say, I'm, I'm, I'm actually the parliamentary wing of John Carr. So <laughs> I do in Parliament what he tells me to do. We have a very, as John mentioned, we have a very, very good coalition of uh, NGOs, 
parliamentarians working together with industry in the UK, a uh, multi-stakeholder approach to tackling some of these issues. Uh, so when John tells me there's a problem, I go off and try and see if we can put pressure on industry uh, to um, to influence uh, the outcomes for protecting our children, and so I have been involved in a bill uh, which is has asked um, internet service providers to demonstrate whether they are using filters to protect our children. Uh, I've also been involved in a bill which is looking at age verification online. I want to just touch on on both of those. Like our previous speaker, I don't want to paint too pessimistic a picture of technology. I think that there are very great opportunities for children, uh, for all of us, but also for children in the new technologies and as they develop. And sometimes we've got to be make sure that we get that balance right so that we don't frighten parents, we don't put children off seizing the huge empowering opportunities that there are. And if I get a moment, I'll, I'll mention a couple of projects that I've been involved in in that, that kind of space. But just to um, kind of summarise my, my main points, in case I don't get to them all, which is um, in the UK, many people look at our method of dealing with these issues, that, that kind of multi-stakeholder approach, uh, and uh, I think many people look at us and say, well, that's, you know, that's, quite, that's very pioneering, and indeed it is. Um, however, as John ind indicated, much of that is predicated on the basis of the family, the parents in the home with a computer having some parental control. We are in an emerging new age which will continue to change a pace that we cannot keep up with. Uh, and therefore I think that one of the important messages that I want to give is that for all of us, be us legislators, policy makers, uh, protectors, one of our key roles I think is to try and anticipate with industry, working with industry, where the technology is taking us. Right now it's taking us down this mobile route, what will the new generation technology look like and what will be the implications of that because at the moment we're very often running behind the technology and working out after the event what the challenges and dangers might be for our, for our children. And so a lot of the, uh, the codes and guidance, which are very, very good indeed, which people like John and other um, NGOs in the UK have helped to develop with government, um, have uh, obviously been based on a static technology, the web, but not based on mobile. So I think we have some catching up to do. We are constantly being outpaced. And that brings, the whole mobile world brings, as John indicated, new challenges in some areas. And I think new vulnerabilities, um, India's been mentioned as an example, Africa too, where there are, where those countries are going to jump over our technologies. They will, they, internet, um, mobile penetration in India is vast. And the, the capacities that we've discussed earlier using the mobile technology will come faster to those countries than the, uh, perhaps the legislation or the guidance or the protections that those children need. And I think the danger is that we could find opening up before us a whole new wave of exploitation of children in those countries without the safeguards necessarily being in place. And therefore, I think it is really incumbent on all of us who are in the developed world, who have done some of the work around the protections necessary, are really you know, offering, and as I stand here, I do, and I'm sure my colleagues do as well, are really saying to everybody who is in that situation where you will jump over us in technology, we, if we can offer any advice or support, not that we know all the answers, then we are willing to do so, because I don't think we've thought through that uh, those people who prey on 
vulnerable children are always 10 steps ahead of us and if they can see that there are vulnerable children um, that will be cheaply and quickly and easily available they will use that and as John also indicated the quality of video on some of these mobile devices is now such that the level of entry, the cost of entry for a predator wishing to, to uh, put images out there is almost nil. And that will mean a huge expansion, I think, in that market. Now, that sounds, that's a very depressing thought, but I think we have to, to see that as an opportunity to work more closely together uh, than perhaps we have uh, in the past. Um, the other uh, question I just put, put out there, really, um, is... Uh, can we ever actually keep up with the technology? And how much effort should we, as people that want to protect our children and, and make sure they have the opportunities rather than the vulnerabilities, how much should we be chasing the technology and how much should we be chasing the money? Um, we've, we've talked, John and I have talked to credit card companies largely around ed, uh, age verification online. However, as we know, particularly child abuse images um, being produced, children being abused in that way, there it is a large and very valuable industry. Uh, it is associated with a whole range of different crimes. Uh, it is a very, very lucrative business. And as the cost of entry goes down, I suspect the, the, the industry in inverted commas, will grow, and perhaps we should be not chasing so much the technology, but looking at where the money is, is going to and where we can intercept that, uh, and, and then therefore make it much more expensive for uh, those who would seek to exploit and abuse our children in that way. Um, as has been said, uh, the, the range of problems have been well discussed. They range from cyberbullying, uh, and, and that ranges within itself from you know, children being persecuted by other children right the way through the, to what was used to be called happy slapping. Effectively, it's children assaulting other children, sometimes very violently indeed or even uh, threatening them with guns and knives and videoing them and putting them on MySpace or YouTube or whatever. Uh, the uh, Right the way through to serious, very, very serious um, high-level child abuse images of the sort which our, uh, which CEOP child exploitation um, unit in the UK deal with, trying to track down both the children and the predator. Uh, it also ranges right the way through to, as been mentioned, the ability to um, trace and track children. And there have been issues, for example, where some parts of industry were selling mobiles to parents packaged so, so as to attract children, nice colours and so on, um, to, to, so that children could track where their children, so that parents could track where their children are. Uh, the only problem with that is, and of course parents naturally worry about where their children are when they're not in their sight, think this is a good child protection mechanism, but actually the concern there is that those devices can be used by somebody with not such uh, Per, which not, not such good intent to track a child. For example, where there's been family violence or where a predator is, is grooming a child, those devices can be used in that way. So what, something that's seen as a benefit in the mobile world can actually also be the, a great vulnerability for children. So we, it's much more complicated than, than just the child abuse images online. As I said, um, in the UK we have developed a uh, into uh, uh, a cross uh, uh, stakeholder approach to this, and we know, uh, and the industry are telling us that the in use of mobile phones is going to increase hugely. At the moment, the uh, Childwise report this just last year showed that 37% of 11 to 16-year-olds have access to the internet via a mobile, um, and as John said, that can be accessed. You know, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, any, you know, from anywhere. Uh, 
21% of five to seven year olds, according to Ofcom, again a report last year, have a mobile phone. Very, very small children in the places like the UK, I guess US and parts of Europe, are now being given mobile phones by their parents largely as a safety mechanism for them, although you'd have to argue whether that's really giving them greater safety. But we have to consider that that not just not only means that there's a huge penetration of mobile phones, but that the, the awareness of very young children about the dangers is very limited. So when we, as John says, when we talk about education, it's a very important aspect of all of this. Uh, but very often, when we've been thinking about some of this, we've been thinking about children 10, 11, 12, 13, maybe a little older. We're actually talking about five-year-olds having mobile phones, and that is, in itself brings other challenges. In the UK, we have um, introduced the UK Code of Practice for the Self-Regulation of New Forms of Content on Mobiles, uh, and that goes back, I think, to 2004, so it's been around for a fair while, and that is really about making sure that the content is age-appropriate wherever, wherever possible, um, and that um, ac unfiltered access uh, you know, it's classified so that there is no uh, access to certain content for under 18 year olds once the network have satisfied themselves of the age verification. Um, and, uh, but the problem really, I think, with that is that there's very few mechanisms for monitoring the effectiveness of some of these guidance. It's all very well putting some of these guidance out there, working with industry to do that, but we've got to have the mechanisms to monitor it. The, uh, the research in 2007 as well showed that the, uh, the mobile network providers expect the use of social networking services via mobile phones to grow exponentially. So we're talking about a huge boom in not just the, the uh, various... Uh, way, various parts of the technology within the mobile, but the access to social networking sites and all forms of content, some of which we all know we are concerned about. And of course, you just have to look at some of the issues around what's been going on on uh, MySpace, where there is much less regulation, where very often people like MySpace don't police the material on there to the extent that some other um, uh, sites do. I mean, YouTube do to a much greater extent. And you then have some really outrageous videos going on. Uh, sorry, it's the other way around. My space do this. YouTube are much less likely to regulate the content of what goes on. So I've, I've if there's any industry in the room, I apologise before you sue me mightily on that one. It is the other way around. Uh, but um, the, the response from YouTube is, no, we won't automatically remove uh, some really disgusting material or very violent material. We'll wait till somebody tells us about it. And that's not a responsible uh, approach, particularly where you have a partnership which depends on self-regulation. And actually, we have to make sure that industry is fully part of this multi-stakeholder partnership. I always say about myself, I'm a legislator that doesn't want to legislate, especially in this field, because, as I said earlier, the legislation takes so long to get onto the statute book, if it's enforceable, if we've got the right legislation, because very often the outcomes of our legislation are not as we intended. But even when we catch up, uh, when we've got the legislation on the statute book, the technology has moved so fast that we're several generations behind. So we do have to have that kind of self-regulation, that partnership, multi-stakeholder working with industry. But industry has to play its part. And just one example of where legislators legislate the wrong way. We were just talking to some parliamentarians from Finland earlier this morning, and I wasn't aware of this, but they told us that they have legislated on filtering, banned certain uh, kinds of access uh, on the web, primarily, uh, and discovered that because it was very well known which sites were being banned, 
the paedophiles immediately go to those sites. They always find ways round. So the legislation is actually counterproductive. So laws aren't going to fix it. Only working with industry is, but industry has to play its part. And there's only a certain, ex you know, the cries from the media, from politicians, that we have to do something about it after the next scandal are such that it is really important that the industry gets firmly involved in this and plays its part. As John's said, the, the issue is not just about the mobile sector getting more gizmos, as I call them, out there, more handsets out there. They are increasingly moving into the, uh, the service and content sector. So they particularly cannot evade their responsibility. So I'm just re-emphasising the point that John made about the need for the mobile sector to get engaged in a way which they sim simply have not uh, to the, up, up until now. I'm getting the uh, I'm getting the hand signal to shut up, so I'll just say very very quickly. Um, we do need more transparency in industry standards, uh, and the UK has just set up uh, a, a new um, uh, body based built on the original. Um, uh, multi-stakeholder approach. We had something called the Byron Review, which looked at the whole spectrum of how children engage with the new technology, ranging from the way that technology um, is used to advertise to children, right the way through to child abuse online. And that um, new body is, is going to advise government, work, again working with industry, to try and make sure that that we are on top of the game. But I think the real, really big challenge for that organisation, for that group, is to, as I say, try and anticipate with industry and try and ensure that industry is designing in the safeguards that are needed from the outside, outset. So in, in terms of when they're developing their new products, they have, alongside us, anticipated the both positive and negative potentials of that technology and designed in the filters or the, the technologies to enable them to do so. That will not fix the problem because actually the problem is about people of one sort or the other. But it is irresponsible, I think, of new generation technologies coming down the line not to take this agenda fully into account. I'll just say very uh, one very quick thing. The technology is a force for good as well. Two projects that I have been involved in, so that we don't take away that it is all bad news. Uh, one was a consultation online with children called Kids Speak, where we talked to them about their experience of family violence, and that was incredibly powerful, and we used that as legislators, the, the voices of the children and experiences of the children themselves, to help inform us, to enable us to legislate to protect them, not online protection particularly, but we used the technology to hear their voices, to inform where, what their real experiences is. So the technology can ena enable us to ensure that children and young people are helping us to be part of the solution about this new online world. My goodness, they know a whole heap more about technology than I will ever know, and they'll be finding ways around things and you know, using technology in different ways to, to the ways that we anticipated. So I think it is really important that we listen to their, those young people and the way that they are using technology now and that they, where they anticipate using technology. And just as another example, to, to prove that the little gizmo that we hang, go around with, um, we're, I'm currently working with um, Blackberry Research in Motion, who are, who are giving free Blackberries in my constituency so that we can, um, we're building into the software so, safeguards so that the children that are affected by violence in the home are able to alert the relevant authorities automatically to take videos and pictures and sound where there is violence as an evidential basis and to have virtual child protection meetings so that all the different agencies that need to, to know about violence against children or family violence and to protect that child 
could do so virtually, saving huge amounts of money and I hope protecting children in the real world as well as in the virtual world. So some good examples, I hope, of where the technology is helping us to help protect our children. Thank you, Margaret. I think that gave us a really good sense of uh, the challenge of dealing with an issue which is so fast moving and how that makes it even more important that all the stakeholders work together and including, of course, with children themselves. Um, I'll move on to Adrian Dwyer from InHope. He stepped in at the very last minute um, to replace a colleague who couldn't be with us today. Um, so thank you, Adrian, for, for being here. So we will. We started late, so we will be carrying on um, about 10 or 15 minutes um, beyond the uh, allotted time for the session. So I hope everyone won't mind waiting a little bit for lunch, so we can fit in all the speakers and also a few questions at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, Ruben Rodriguez, who is our president. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't make it to the meeting here, and he does send his apologies. Um, and he has uh, kindly forward, forwarded me some of the information that he was going to uh, relay to you. Uh, first of all, if I could introduce myself, my name is Adrian Dwyer and I'm the network coordinator for InHope. I've been with InHope since the beginning of the year. I, uh, prior to that, was the uh, hotline manager for the Internet Watch Foundation in the UK. InHope is the International Association of Hotlines. We have 33 member hotlines uh, around the world. We are uh, an EC project. We started in 99 and we currently say with these 33 members uh, the majority are in the EC but we do have members outside uh, the EC such as um, US, Canada, Australia, Japan, South Korea and, and Taiwan are currently our members. And we, do, we have a lot of interest from outside uh, the EU as well as actually becoming uh, member hotlines there. And these are non-government hotlines, but they work very closely with the national law enforcement. They have full support of government and industry and are able to provide a reporting facility for members of the public to report to, which is removed from law enforcement. They um, deal with all uh, material which is assessed to be illegal or considered to be illegal in the, within their own country but across the network the overriding um, offence crime which the uh, network deals with uh, are images of child sexual abuse. Every hotline around the world deals with, uh, with that and I think um, if we could uh, just go to what John was saying earlier um, when I was at the Internet Watch Foundation last year, I was talking to the uh, Japanese hotline who, um, who said uh, that uh, at the end of 2006 was the first time that internet access via mobile had actually exceeded fixed access. And we had quite a discussion about, uh, about their access and, and why we didn't have so much, uh, such a strong um, mobile access uh, in the UK, such strong figures as they'd. And really, it's, uh, it seemed at the time to me uh, to boil a lot down to expense. Um, in, to access the internet in, in Japan using your mobile is uh, very, very cheap. Whereas in the UK, it was at the time was, was quite expensive. So that could be one reason, one reason there. And I know this is a, a quite a sort of hot topic in in Japan, as uh, the Japanese hotline is is quite involved in the uh, in the discussions there. But uh, so Ruben kindly um, passed me on these uh, these couple of slides here, and they are uh, U.S. cases. Uh, Ruben actually comes from the uh, uh, from ICMEC the International Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, who are uh, part of the National Centre, which is uh, 
a member hotline of the In Hope Association. And as, an as a, uh, a hotline there, they have a very well resourced hotline. I think uh, many hotlines would like the uh, facilities and that they have there. Uh, but they, all, they deal with a lot of aspects of um, child abuse, missing children, and so on. And they have excellent uh, reporting facilities there. One of the, um, they actually provide a 24 hour telephone hotline as well as uh, an internet hotline as well. So they are ideally positioned to uh, collate and uh, receive such, uh, such reports as they, uh, as they do. Well, so far this year, I won't read them all out there, but uh, it's all on the, on the screen here. So far this year, they've had 108 reports and 56 of those are relating to uh, child pornography or um, there are 40, uh, 40 reports referring to possible online uh, enticement, uh, grooming and so on. And seven other reports, um, this would be uh, threats, bullying and so on. So this is a new, uh, a new uh, medium that the, the hotline is starting to deal with here. And you know, already they've had say, 100 reports. Uh, I know that's, uh, that's not great in the scale of things, but um, now people are beginning to see somewhere that they can actually pass these, uh, this information on to. And I know a lot of this is, uh, say, these are Rubens figures, and so they are very much uh, US-based. But uh, just to show that it's not just um, uh, US, uh, in, in Ireland, um, uh, earlier on this year, a man has just been sentenced to three years imprisonment for um, having unlawful sexual intercourse with a... Uh, with a 14-year-old girl. Now, he took pictures of that, uh, that child using his mobile camera, um, indecent pictures of that child um, during, the, during the assault. And this only came to light when he, uh, um, I believe he's a 50-odd-year-old 50, 50 man, this only came to light when he, uh, he asked his friend to uh, change the ringtone on the phone. His friend actually found these uh, images and uh, subsequently reported reported them there. So, mobile f mobile phones are being used more and more to um, to record uh, such uh, you know, illegal acts, and and also the as um, John has said earlier, the, the tremendous storage facility that they provide. Um, I know myself that uh, whilst at the Internet Watch Foundation last year, um, we were seeing in commercial websites more and more sites, commercial websites, were offering images and the more graphic images of children being sexually abused and uh, sometimes raped. And these are obviously taken using... Um, taken by the offender themselves. These are not commercially produced pictures. And the storage facility and the tremendous picture power that these uh, cameras now have, to, to talk of 10 megapixel uh, cameras on a, on a phone is, is amazing. So to have, to have that in such a small device is an ideal um, machine to allow uh, people to record these images and uh, and to obviously to share them on, um, there is uh, another another case, and this this case was in the U.S., where nine children in a um, children's hospital uh, pictures were taken of them uh, using the mobile phone. Um, these are indec decent pictures of of the children and. They were passed not only from mobile phone to mobile phone, but they are now circulating on the internet. And obviously, once it's on the internet, it's it's there forever. So um, these victims are continually going to re remain available for uh, 
you know, offenders, collectors, to, uh, to look at. Uh, there have been several cases in the US where children have been um, taking indecent pictures of themselves, nude pictures, um, mainly to send to their boyfriends or uh, sometimes to their classmates. And uh, there have been several cases, one notably in Ohio, where a 15-year-old girl uh, took some indecent uh, pictures of herself, uh, post posted them to her uh, boyfriend, and um, has subsequently been uh, arrested and uh, is being charged with uh, distributing uh, illegal images. And these are images of her own, of her own body, self. Uh, groups of girls at uh, one school, in fact there was nine girls at one school took uh, indecent pictures of themselves and uh, passed them around uh, to their classmates. Now these, these girls have now uh, all subsequently been identified and uh, social services are now involved trying to uh, really sort of explain uh, the error of their ways and um, things around there. So uh, that's some of the picture from the, from the US. That's a very short um, introduction to InHope of who we are. Um, so the hotlines are there um, to take reports of um, uh, child abuse, uh, child sexual abuse um, online or child pornography as it's uh, sometimes called. Um, and uh, that basically is, is me covered. So I've tried to do it as quick as I can, bearing in mind that uh, everybody's probably quite hungry now and uh, we've had quite a, a good long session today. So uh, thank you very much for allowing me to step in for Ruben. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adrian. It's really useful to get a perspective from the hotlines on how mobile phones can be used um, for the abuse of children, and including, I think, an important issue of how children themselves um, can use their mobiles, and the uh, the um, the results are sometimes not what they predict themselves. Um, we now got some time for questions, comments, and so on from the floor. Um, also, particularly interested to get um, any comments and viewpoints from people from other parts of the world, because we're aware that this panel has been fairly European focused. Um, so, can I start? Can go, is, has someone got a microphone? My name is Jutta Kroll. I'm representing the Youth Protection Roundtable, another European project funded within the Safer Internet Programme of the European Commission. And this roundtable is uh, working uh, together with uh, developers of technology on the one hand and children's welfare uh, representative on the other hand, uh, exactly to avoid that situation what uh, John Carr has been talking about, that we do not share responsibility, but we have responsibility on the one hand and uh, the technology providers say, okay, it's up to the mobile operators, or on the other hand, the mobile operators say it's up to the manufacturers. So that use protection our table is to overcome that, that problem. But my question goes in another direction. I want to ask you to stall. Uh, you mentioned that high penetration rate uh, of mobile phones uh, for children, for young age children. Do you have any uh, evidence uh, if whether there is the same digital divide we have with access to uh, internet computers with mobile phones, or might the mobile way be uh, a solution to overcome the digit digital divide? Because we know that less educated children have less access to computers, they have less digital literacy, but it might be that they have the same access to mobile phones than the well-educated children. Thank you. Well, uh, you could see the, from a Danish perspective where the digital divide virtually doesn't exist because all children, young people, have access to, to the internet and advanced computers. If not at home, which primarily all, almost everybody do, then at school or other places. But the, 
Uh, and regarding mobile phones, it's not a question of digital divide. It might, it might be a question of how much you can afford to, which, which type of mobile you can afford. Uh, for instance, uh, the iPhone, which is highly popular among some of my students, uh, but not everybody can afford it. But then they may now be able to buy the next generations of these advanced mobiles that are rapidly coming in, following uh, the iPhones. and. And so on. Uh, and another thing, of course, as we just heard, also it's also a question of cost. How much does it cost to access the internet, uh, and how much do you want to use it? So, but on a global scale, I'm quite certain that it is actually a question of how much you can afford. Because, uh, I mean, we collect our used mobiles. Uh, young people in Denmark uh, exchange their mobiles every seven to eight months or so, and the old mobiles are exported to developing countries. So they are obviously is sometimes a generation behind. But on the other hand, I know from some of my students who have been, for instance, to Uganda, that the first time they were there two years ago, most people had old use uh, mobiles, but now increasingly more people have advanced mobiles as well because they become cheaper. So it's developing so fast. Of course, it is a pattern that we see, uh, but I do think, actually, as I said, that the mobile is the device, as you said, for the more democratic spread of, of uh, uh, the internet and, and other digital uh, aspects of, of media users. <coughs> we'll take the microphone to the the gentleman at the back in the corner. Oh, are the microphones there? We'll start there. Yeah. Thank you, Steve Del Bianco with Net Choice Coalition. Um, I think Margaret. This is a question for all the panelists, but Margaret, you identified correctly that it's really about people. In some cases, it's bad people trying to do bad things to children, but it's also about good people professional law enforcement. So my question would be, are the governments that all of you are involved with doing enough to add trained and equipped law enforcement professionals to follow up on the leads that Adrian's hotline and that industry is identifying and feeding in to the law enforcement pipeline? Because those leads have to be acted on quickly and they take a lot of time and resources to follow up on. Experience in the U.S. has been dismal. Only 2% of the leads that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children are actually followed up on a timely basis by law enforcement. We've got to do better, or we're never going to be able to pursue and control child predators. Don't would like to respond to that. Perhaps we'll take a few more. Yeah. We'll take a few more questions first, and then uh, we'll go to the panel. The lady here at the front. Uh, thank you very much, Stana Kobziva, Social um, Council of Central Russia. Uh, my question is for our colleagues uh, from uh, United Kingdom. I'd like to notice uh, uh, whether uh, the British law requires uh, the providers to filter internet traffic or it requi requires uh, the producers of mobile phones to install uh, a special software into the mobile phones. And the second question is if um, an individual can refuse to deal with uh, um, this uh, service or with this service. 